Thank you for joining us today with the Learning Together newsletter. I'm here with Carrie Ann Robinson. Um, Carrie Ann, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I am a board certified behavior analyst. I have been a behavior analyst working um, with a variety of different populations for about 20 years now. Um, I started out working with uh, little kiddos with autism in uh, intensive behavior intervention, IBI, ABA. Um, and from there, I started working with adolescents, adults with developmental disabilities, dual diagnosis. Um, I've worked with uh, typically developing teens and their caregivers um, who have delinquent behavior. I've worked with, um, I guess, all sorts of populations right now, are uh, previously and right now. Um, currently, I am owner and clinical director of Progressive Steps Training and Consultation. Um, and there we focus on supporting teens and adults with autism and other developmental disabilities and pretty much living their best life. Um, and so we work directly with the individuals teaching a variety of skills um, or with their caregivers and different support staff. We do lots of staff training, caregiver training um, as well. And so that's who I am, what I do. Awesome. That's great. Very diverse background, and you've been in the field for a significant amount of time. Um, today, we're going to talk about acceptance and commitment therapy. So, Kirian, can you tell me what is acceptance commitment therapy, also known as ACT? So, today we'll refer to it as ACT. Okay. And so, I'm still, I'm no ACT guru. <laughs> <laughs> um, ACT is pretty new to me and to my practice, but um, what I've learned about it and what I'm using it for so far, I'm loving it. Um, and I'm still learning sort of more about it sort of on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but what I know about it so far and what I've been doing with it, I'm happy to share. Um, and so it's, it's hard to explain, I think, what ACT is because it's, it's a big thing that involves lots of different things, but it's it's pretty much a treatment package um, or really a set of tools and strategies um, that we can use to help people pretty much accept and make peace with sort of things that happen day to day that are outside of their control or that they may not like. And instead to use that energy to commit to actions and behaviors that bring them closer to the things that are important to them or closer to their values. Um, it does that by teaching people ways to manage their thoughts and feelings. So instead of wrestling um, with your thoughts and feelings or rules that you might have about how things should or shouldn't be, um, you spend time engaging in behaviors that orient you towards the things that you value, um, which are long-term positive reinforcers pretty much. Um, in ACT, we use lots of metaphors, stories, lots of different exercises, really to help people um, experience their private events, so their thoughts and feelings, um, while engaging in more appropriate behavior that gets them to where they want to go. Um, ACT, and to do that, there's sort of six um, core processes or components um, that help you accept and make peace with things and act according to your values. Um, and so I can go into those like really briefly. Um, there's diffusion and that's pretty much being able to treat your thoughts for what they are. They're just pretty much noise in your head um, and the ability to like not get hooked on your thoughts and not let them take over your mind and control your behavior. Um, there's values, where it's just pretty much just identifying the types of things that are important to you. Um, and so as behavior analysts, I'd see those as long-term delayed consequences. Um, there's committed actions, and those are the actual behaviors that you're going to do that gets you closer to your values. Um, there's acceptance, which is being okay or being willing to experience um, everything that comes along, the bad and the good stuff. Um, and really not trying to avoid um, experiences because you find them reversive. 
Um, and then there's self as context, which is, uh, I think the hardest to explain and the hardest for me to wrap my head around and to teach yeah. my clients, but it's really being the real you and knowing and observing how, um, your thoughts and feelings and actions can change dependent on context. And so it's kind of being that person that's noticing that there's all these things about you and that your thoughts, feelings, and behavior don't necessarily define that is act in a nutshell <laughs> yeah very high level overview of act right yeah. thank you so much that was a really comprehensive answer um and you touched base on this already as what the goal of act is but if someone so say a client or a caregiver were to approach you um, and want to receive act services or services in line with act um what could they expect to get out of it so I guess the goal when I'm, when I'm using it with, and I think the goal um, of ACT with my, with different clients kind of is varies. Um, but really, I guess the overarching goal is to just change the function of the private events or the thoughts and feelings for them. And so usually when I'm deciding to uh, use some ACT tools and strategies with a client or a family or a caregiver, it's because um, there's, they seem to be getting stuck in some way. There's some sort of problematic behavior that I think may be related to some of the private events or thoughts and feelings that they're having. Um, and so we introduce ACT or ACT tools and strategies as a way to um, help decrease the impact that their thoughts and feelings might be having on their behavior and then it has increased the appropriate behaviors that lead them more to where they want to be instead. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so who can benefit from ACT? Um, so pretty much anyone with language skills, I would say. Um, like really, uh, who doesn't want um, their thoughts and feelings not to control their behavior in their life? Yeah. Right? Um, so really anyone. I use it for myself. I use it for my family. Um, my three-year-old uh, talks in ACT language, talks about her values and her committed actions. My five-year-old definitely does as well. I've used it with, um, you know, a lot of my clients with all different needs and, and levels. And so I, I really think anyone, you don't have to have any sort of like psychiatric illness or mental health issue um, or not necessarily, you don't even necessarily have to have a behavior that you want to change. I just think it's a, it's kind of, it, can be viewed as like a philosophy or a way of looking at life from a different lens that just makes it makes you happier yeah i've actually read the happiness trap by russ harris and it's a fantastic yeah. book have you read it yeah 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 i recommend everyone to go out and grab the happiness trap by russ harris um it's a fantastic introduction into act and it's really user-friendly and um lots of tons of exercises inside of it that you can you can do on your own mm -hmm. Um, so how do you currently incorporate ACT into your practice? Um, so uh, lots of different ways. And so, um, as I mentioned, I'm pretty new to ACT. Um, and so, and I think like a lot of behavior analysts incorporating ACT, um, which is very, very different on the outside from yeah. like what we typically do can be pretty scary. Um, and so for me, I started out small, just like learning about it, doing reading, listening to all of the podcasts, um, trying out some exercises for myself and my family to really help me get a good understanding of it. I, I really don't think anyone should be using ACT or any of the ACT tools with clients until they really understand it. And I, I feel like you, it's one of those things where you have to uh, practice it before you preach it right. um, in order to, to be able to teach it better. Um, I've received some training in it from different colleagues that are more experienced than I am in it. I went to the ACT boot camp. Um, and then following the boot camp, I really started to implement it across, um, I'd say most of my clients, at least some components of it. Um, currently, I use it with um, the majority of my clients, I'd probably say all of my clients that are verbal, 
um, have some ACT components within their programming right now. Um, and so that includes um, mostly people with autism between the ages of six and 30, a variety of, um, I guess, uh, functioning levels um, with a like wide variety of profiles and sort of areas of need and goals. Um, I've also used it with um, their caregivers and staff. So it's not something that I just use with, I guess, my clients. I'm also using it with the people that are supporting them. Um, so I use a lot. I think what makes it easier for me to implement as someone new to ACT um, is I use a lot of like the ACT-based curriculum packages that are available. So um, I use the AIM curriculum a lot. So accept, identify, move. And so that's a curriculum made for um, kids on the spectrum. And so I'm able to take a lot of lessons in there as well as a lot of the lessons from Mark Dixon's book, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy for Kids with Autism um, and adapt them as needed to whoever I'm working with, um, depending on their skill levels and what they can understand and, and stuff like that. And so I, I use uh, those types of things a lot with kids. Um, I, um, I'll also be doing the uh, online training soon for the DNA V um, curriculum, which is discover, notice, or advise or values. And so that's like another act based package. Um, more geared towards teenagers. Um, but a uh, thing I like about like, so the AIM, um, Mark Dixon's book, and then this, it just makes it easier and more accessible for people to do, especially because I do, I work with a lot of um, behavior therapists that work with me that don't have the same amount of um, knowledge and training and supervision with ACT. And so I'm able to sort of provide them with these tools and resources so they can implement it with their clients as well. Um, what else? We've done it in groups with kids. Um, we've done it face to face. And now, thanks to COVID, we're doing a lot of it virtually. Um, it's pretty neat. We're using things like um, Boom learning cards to make it really interactive with, 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 with kids virtually and, and with adults. Um, um, and yeah, so far we're having lots of fun with it. Um, when I'm using it with um, therapists or caregivers or uh, support staff, I usually am using the ACT matrix, which is um, another tool that um, pretty much fuses all of the ACT components into one. Um, and we've used that um, on like simple staff behavior, like just being late for work and trying to figure out why you're late for work and what you can do to not be late for work anymore. And um, more complex things like, you know, being burnt out, not able to implement behavior intervention. That's great. I mean, I think that's so useful and valuable. And it's really interesting that ACT is so flexible and that you can implement it with such a diverse range of individuals, right? Even across age, functioning level, diagnoses, everything. You're, you're pretty much saying that um, almost everyone can kind of benefit from this lifestyle or this lens um, yeah. from the ACT perspective, which is very, very interesting. Um, so you mentioned the ACT matrix mm -hmm. and could you lead me through uh, an exercise that you would use with caregivers or staff? This is, let me move all my Zoom stuff out of the way. Uh, Fillable act matrix that I have on a little PowerPoint presentation here. Um, and so the matrix is divided into these four quadrants. And one of the cool things about the matrix is it helps people experience like the differences between um, their sort of overt behavior and covert behavior, and then sort of what it feels like to be doing things that have you move away from your values and towards your values. Um, and so when I'm doing it with somebody, and so Nicole, um, should I do it with you as a behavior therapist? Sure. Okay. And so we can talk about like the, I always start with talking about um, the person's values. And this is in the bottom over here, <laughs> the bottom <laughs> right quadrant. Um, and so we start with talking about the types of things 
the people and um, what's important to you. And that gives you an idea of the person's values, which is one of the core processes of ACT. And so, Nicole, I guess as a behavior therapist, what are the types of things and the people that are important to you? Um, my clients or the individuals I support are very important to me, um, ensuring that they have a good quality life. Um, but also the, the other staff that I'm working with, so the other individuals on my team, um, I want them to also um, be providing um, quality support and services, but also ensure that they are um, staying healthy themselves as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think what else. This is a, a tough one. So providing behavior analytic supports and services as well, that's evidence-based and data-driven. Um, and that's from the behavior therapist perspective, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, could we start with that? Yeah, that's good. That's a really good list of the types of things that are important to you, right. the types of things that you value. And so in this area, we talk about the thoughts and feelings that show up when things get tough. Okay. Um, and so when things are hard, it's, it's um, what are the types of things that uh, go through your mind and types of things that you feel and experience? So do you mean like, say I'm like working with a family or an individual and like things are getting hard? Yeah, things, things I guess that would be preventing you from doing these things. Okay. Um, thoughts like um, it's not going to work, like the program is not going to work. Okay. Um, my training's not good enough. So thinking like the training I'm providing to staff is not sufficient. Um, sometimes I think I can't do it, you know, just like doubting whether I'm even capable of, of doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, even just thoughts of like, it's too hard, it's too complex, it's never gonna get better. I know for me as a behavior therapist and behavior consultant, sometimes I feel, even though I've been doing that for 20 years and I feel like I'm pretty good at what I do. Yeah. Uh, this imposter syndrome happens yeah. all the time too, where um, I, I feel like, especially when it comes to like complex cases that like, you know, maybe I shouldn't really be doing it. <laughs> um, like, do I know what I'm talking about? Like, is this right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a common one. Um, Always like second guessing yourself. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or feelings that would show up? I think those are the main ones. Okay. Um, and so these are the thoughts. And so when you think about those core processes I talked about earlier, these are like the thoughts and feelings that would uh, sort of take over your mind and um, impact how you behave. Um, and so I talked about diffusion, which is unhooking those thoughts and feelings from your mind and behavior. Um, and instead here, this is where these thoughts and, and feelings get fused to uh, you and your mind and your behavior. And because of that, you do these types of things. And so these are the things that you do um, when those thoughts and feelings show up for you. What types of behaviors do you find yourself engaging in? Um, I'll overwork. So I'll you know, um, answer or write emails, you know, really late at night and then it interferes with my sleep. Okay. Or I'll do the opposite where I kind of shut down um, and maybe need to take a day off or two. Mm -hmm. um, or um, what else? Sometimes procrastinating on the, the tasks that I find really difficult. Mm -hmm. So concentrating more on doing things that are easy to do and putting off the ones that um, are causing me stress. 
Um, I also find myself like I don't really take care of myself as much. Like I won't eat as often. Um, I won't take breaks. Um, I'm kind of like fully immersed and I'm, it's really hard to pull myself away, which as we know can be harmful too, right? Not taking breaks for yourself. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes this is where mistakes are made too, right? When you're um, not on purpose, but inadvertently you may make mistakes because you're, um, you're so focused on those, you're so fused with um, those unhelpful thoughts. Right. So maybe you're not making, you're not making sound decisions. Okay. And so when you look at this list of things that you usually do, mm -hmm. um, do any of these things help these thoughts and feelings uh, go away permanently? No, they're still there. Yes, they're still there. And then um, when you do things, when you do these things, especially in excess, um, does that bring you like closer to the things that are important to you or further away? Much further away. And it, it's almost like a cycle yeah. where things get worse. Yeah. Yeah. And so they also, by doing these things, these things also get worse too. Yeah. So you're right. Feeling around these things. And so um, when I'm doing the matrix with people like, like it helps us um, kind of do a little bit of an assessment of whether or not our current strategies are working, right? right. And so this is our current thinking and these are their, our current strategies and they're not, they're not really working. Right. Um, and so instead of using these things, we'll try to think about things that we can do, behaviors that we can do to get us closer to these things that we value, um, even when we're experiencing these thoughts and feelings. And so what are some things that you think that you can do when you're experiencing these thoughts and feelings that will bring you closer towards your goals? Um, yeah, I think first and foremost would be um, getting proper sleep, setting bound like work boundaries, um, maybe even timers to eat regularly, um, meal prepping. <laughs> Those can all be really helpful to manage stress throughout the week. Um, and then also prioritizing my day or like structuring my day. Um, so ensuring that I'm like giving myself time to work on difficult tasks. Um, yeah. And then, uh, another one would be reaching out for help. So calling a colleague, communicating with them, talking through a situation, um, I think asking for help is a really important one, especially when, you know, we can't always know the answer. So getting help is really important. Um, let me think what else. Uh, I think, you know, sometimes maybe scheduling some time off isn't such a bad thing as long as it's um, mindful so that I'm using that time to take care of myself or to do what I need to do and it's scheduled. It's not kind of like a reaction to how I'm feeling. Maybe just recognizing if I'm really stressed and scheduling some time, like a, a morning or afternoon off to yeah. engage in like some self-care. Cool. Yeah. So, so those are some really good actions that would get you towards helping your clients that you support, ensuring that they have a good quality of life because you'll be able to provide better ABA supports. Yeah. And then I think a lot of those go really in line with this value of being healthy. Yeah as well um and so that is great and so what we have here um is pretty much a tool to help us um recognize the choices that we can make regarding our behaviors throughout the day um and to notice this noticing thing here is um now that we have all these written down and we've thought about it um, while we're sort of living our daily lives, we should be noticing sort of the types of things we're thinking and feeling and when these thoughts are coming up, when we're more thinking about our values um, and sort of attending to where we are on this matrix. Um, and we talk a lot about pivoting. I know I talk about 
with my <laughs> three-year-old and my five-year-old, we'll talk about pivoting towards their values and whether or not they're pivoting away or uh, towards. Um, and so these types of things, when you notice that you're doing these types of things, you can choose to pivot back towards your values and, and get yourself to do some of these things. Um, so that's pretty much how I use the matrix um, with families, uh, caregivers, staff, uh, my kids. <laughs> um, I love that example. Yeah, myself um, to help identify the types of things that I could be doing. And so it's really just an assessment of what, what you're doing that's probably not working and then really thinking about the types of things that you can be doing. Um, and then being aware um, of the choices that you can make throughout the day to get closer to your values. I love this exercise. I love how it just kind of like so plainly puts it all out into this nice, into nice categories. It's so easy. Mm -hmm. um, and you can really get a feel for what's been going on, like what's really getting in the way. Um, and I love how it organizes everything as well. Uh, and it was, it was interesting to me doing this with you, actually. I didn't think I was going to go that way with the health. But clearly, that's something that I truly value. And it's something that, you know, my own personal health is definitely something that can, um, is really important to me to be able to also um, support the individuals in, in my service, right? Um, they like, they're very closely intertwined. For sure. um, and I thought that was really interesting. I really, really didn't expect to get that out of this. But um, thank you. That's great. Well, there you go. <laughs> What I do, like if I'm doing this with teams, like we'll do um, an act matrix with like a whole team and then we'll print it out and put it up. And it's something that we kind of refer, like sometimes if I see someone doing something on the left side, I'll say, where are you on that mm -hmm. matrix right now? And I'll have them go and kind of like identify that they're walking away from their values. And it's like a quick and easy way for them to like, you know, make that pivot to, the other way and start thinking about what they could be doing or what they need to be doing instead. Um, again, my kiddos all the time, um, like we're very much in the ACT household and um, um, we're constantly using this type of language to reinforce and reward their behavior as well. And I teach my clients to do it as well. And so, um, you know, if they're uh, about to have a tantrum because it's time to go to bed, I'll be like, you know, is that gonna be, away from your value of being a good family member or is that going to be towards your value and you can see my daughter thinking of like oh that's going to be a way and then she'll she'll make that shift and she'll make that choice in her behavior to do something that's more in line with the person that she wants to be so it's it's really neat that's yeah that sounds really powerful i'd love to see that in action with with your kids yeah. i'm sure it would be it's really interesting yeah. So thanks for joining us today, Carrie Ann. This was really interesting and insightful. Um, so you, to our viewers, please go check out the Learning Together newsletter on the Acceptance and Commitment Therapy edition for more information. And we'll link to some resources as well that were discussed in this interview, as well as other resources um, on ACT. Okay, have a great day. Thanks, Carrie Ann. Thank you. Bye. Bye.